young trooper, a very young trooper in the Biafran army. How old are you? I'm 10 years. 10 years old. Yes. Do you know why Biafra is fighting? Biafra is fighting for survival, sir. Is it going to win? Yes, sir. This is Nkwalo Junction, right now about three miles behind the furthest advance of Biafran troops to the south. There was heavy fighting here in early May as the Biafrans retook the town. Okwala Junction is 25 miles from Port Harcourt a major seaport and refinery city the Biafrans want back. The Biafran troops we found at this road junction were a ragtag collection looking more like irregulars than the frontline soldiers of the 14th Division who are currently engaged in Biafra's most successful offensive of the war. How the Biafran army succeeds, armed as it is with an odd lot collection of weapons, is a puzzle. Some at the front carry communist-made AK-47s, like those used by the Viet Cong. Some only World War I bold-action antiques. Others, modern British semi-automatics. And their pride, and heaviest weapon, a 30 caliber machine gun just captured from the Nigerians. Much, in fact, of what the Biafrans are now using against the Nigerians, they have taken from them. One military man up here told me, not totally as a joke, that Biafra now looks upon the Nigerian army as its quartermaster general. And if the Nigerian army runs on beer and bullets, the Biafran army lacks both, with ammunition constantly in critically short supply. These troops had advanced six miles in less than a week. Then, practically out of ammunition, were forced to stop on the road to Port Harcourt until more supplies trickled down to them. One of this army's other problems is staying large enough to continue the fight against Nigeria's. When Biafra seceded in 1967, it had fewer than a thousand men under arms, and those mostly officers and clerks. Now it has been built up to between 45 and 60,000, the exact number, a military secret. Volunteers made the original army build-up easy. Now conscription of virtually all able-bodied young men is underway. And in a former school compound, we found recruits drilling, marching in the mud to the improbable tune of Margie. These new soldiers are also taught the rudiments of jungle warfare and ambush to be used against an enemy which holds most of Biafra's major cities several vital road links, but not too much of the countryside. The training is basic, but effective. You're going to stop us right by the shoulder here. I don't want to defend it. Go. His spirit, and that of this tattered army, driven by fear of genocide which may or may not lie ahead if they lose, plus what must be massive ineptitude on the part of the Nigerian army, is the most probable reason that this war of unequals now has gone into its third year. Hey! 
And here I met a young trooper, a very young trooper in the Biafran Army. How old are you? I'm 10 years. 10 years old. Yes. Do you know why Biafra is fighting? Biafra is fighting for survival. Is it going to win? Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, how old were you when you joined the Biafran Army? Uh, I joined the Biafran Army when I was 15. Okay. Boys come? No. They were conscripting anybody. No, but the, the conscription hadn't started at the time. Yeah, I was like what, what year was I was joined in 67? Yeah. Huh? When did yeah. you what your yeah. Right. But I was I was huge then. Okay. So that if I falsified my age, people yeah, wouldn't exactly. doubt it. Some some people did falsify their age. Yeah. My cousin True. Did. So did you um were you were you were you in high school when you joined or you yeah. finished high school? Yeah. Alright. <clears throat> I happen to be the second in tip of your top. And um, ended up uh, commanding 53 infantry battalion. Mm -hmm. Venerable uh, Mokwe Mo was in the battalion. Uh, and the day he saw me there, it was a wonderful experience for him. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the war, because of the, yeah, that's, that's because of the wound I sustained, okay, song, the tumor, you know, and it's there. The thing there. Okay, but thank God. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 <clears throat> the it, it, it was a situation where nobody knew who, who would leave the next day to the next day or even the next minute because it was a situation where you were eating and bomb will drop and then you would abandon your eating and rush to the front to see what was happening. So that it was really never a dull moment throughout the world, especially for those that were in the forward uh, location. And one of one of the things that one of the experiences that I don't think I will forget, among, amongst other experiences that I will share with you, was the day I received the news that my elder brother had been shot by, not in the war front, but by a fellow Biafran soldier. Uh, and um, when I I left to go to uh, to find out exactly what happened. They refused me seeing the uh, the captain that shot my brother because he was under arrest. And uh, as if they knew, because I was quite prepared to kill him if I saw him, but they wouldn't let me see him. But be that as it may. We had several experiences. I was in charge of a cotted banana on my hemianites. And that was the first place through which they wanted to enter into my. So for me and for my troops, it was never a dull moment. It was never a dull moment because they did everything humanly possible to come in through that place, that we were able to resist them. And with the, uh, with the, brigade, uh, with the brigade commanders, like uh, Colonel Achiba, who incidentally died fighting with me, it wasn't easy for the houses to penetrate through the cutter line or my analysis. So they now decided to go to Ohafia, the demo And uh, the brigade, I mean, the, the commander of that uh, area wasn't a very strong commander. He wasn't a combatant commander. So he only depended on giving instructions from the rear. 
unlike somebody like Achebo who would come and they would ask you, where are these bastards? And you, you go to the ops room and you show him where they are, so they must be flushed out of this place now. And that's how he planned his battle. And war will start. And then we will go to the forward location and uh, sometimes the battle will last for two, three days, non-stop. You know. But he, he made sure that he accomplished his objectives. Um, a lot of time we were able to capture Ecotech Benito twice. And uh, he headed for you. Said that we must touch you and that we must touch your caliper. But that never materialized. So I say that to say that <coughs> there was a number of our people, our boys, our brothers, who, who was so determined to help Biafra succeed that they didn't mind if they shed their blood or even give their life for the survival of Biafra. And the important thing also to note is that we did not have enough ammunition. Sometimes, even a, a battalion commander like myself would only have 12 rounds of ammunition to go to. But we managed to hold the <coughs> for three years which told me that if we had the support of any of the Western powers, that we would have defeated Wolf with the Nigerian forces. Because it is a situation where you fire a wooden way, you will see them sling their weapon and <laughs> will be running. Yeah, some of them will be saying, Biafra, wait till you blow. Wait till you blow. But all in all, when, um, when, when uh, <coughs> they declared the end of the war and the secession series, I was wounded and I was in the bush. I was in the bush for three days, you know, bleeding. And uh, I can show you this car. So I was shouting in the bush because I had given up and I was prepared to die. I said, I was shouting, Vandals, what can you do? Vandals. So some three of them heard my voice and followed and came into the bush. Three federal troops. Three federal troops came into the bush. And uh, I didn't even know that the war had ended. So when they came in, I was reaching for my gun to shoot, even though I was incapacitated. I was reaching for my gun to shoot, and one of them said, don't shoot, war don't end. So they came and carried me from uh, the bush, carried me from the bush, and uh, took me to their battalion headquarters where I received uh, the first um, the first aid. Good treatment. Huh? Said good treatment. Yeah. I got first aid and um, finally I was taken to uh, Afiku. When I got to Afiku, the surgeon that was to supposedly cut my leg got called to Inugu on an emergency. So that's how I'm still standing with my legs. Got called to Inugu, and then he decided to transfer me to Inugu, where he would then in his, uh, carry out the operation. But when I went to Inugu, <coughs> I met a British soldier who took liking to me and said that, that he would like me to join the Nigerian army. 
and that he was going to save my leg. So I didn't believe him because, I mean, you should have seen the condition of the leg. I didn't believe him at all. Because you're talking of a situation where I stepped into a mine, my tibia and fibula were shattered, and um, when I stayed in, the three days I stayed in the bush, maggots and everything infested the next so that day. So I never believed that I would walk again with this leg. I was even begging for the leg to be amputated. So when I got to Enugu, the British surgeon that came one, took liking to me and said he was going to save my leg. So he operated on me, and I wasn't staying in the um, ward of uh, the Biafran troops. They took me to their of own officer's uh, ward, and I was, it was like they were giving me a pack of secrets every day. Not, not just one pack, but a roll, you know, of cigarettes. And then I was smoking and uh, providing me with hot drinks and all that. And then he brought me a phone after he operated on me. The way he operated, there was a cross, he, he did a cross union of the tibia and fibula. And then was giving me some medication that he said would uh, enhance uh, callus formation so that the bones would join. Then he brought me a form to fill to join the Nigerian army. And uh, being loud mouthed, I went and told my sister that I'm going into Nigerian army. Yeah, my soldier. So, she asked the Ike Then she took the form and tore it. So when the the uh, the doctor came the following day to uh, take the form, I told him I didn't have it. And immediately I was transferred to be a first. <laughs> Let, 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 let me interrupt you, Ken. Because we, I, I, I would like to get in at least to the other two uh, veterans. Uh, how old were you when you joined the Biafran Army? Uh, I joined the Biafran Army when I was 15. Okay. The Boys Club? No. They were conscripting anybody. No, but the, the conscription hadn't started at the time. Yeah, I was like what, what year was I was joined in 67? Yeah. Huh? When did yeah. you join your 67? But I was I was huge then, okay, okay. so that if yeah. I falsified my age, people yeah, wouldn't yeah. doubt it. Some some people did falsify their age. Yeah. My cousin. True. Did. So did you um were you were uh, you were you in high school when you joined? Or you yeah. High school? yeah. All right. <laughs> Nina, anyone here can